to the You've Heard It Said podcast. This is Jason. And this is Allie. And I'm just sitting here holding one of those cans of sparkling water, you know, the kind that are like lightly flavored, yes, no calories, yes. no sweeteners. Gross. <laughs> Everybody's doing it right now. So anyways, I'm looking at the little tab on the top, you know, the thing you pull and it pushes down the little mouth that you drink out of. Mouth? <laughs> I mean, that's where you put, you know what I mean. Yeah. So, uh, I'm looking at the tab and I'm just thinking like, it knows exactly what to do. You know, every time I pull it, it opens, it fits perfectly. It has that tiny little tab circle that holds it down. And if I open it, it works. I'm just gonna open it. I just love that noise, isn't it? It's like so satisfying. Why are you talking about a soda or a water? I, I don't know. So the reason is because when I was looking at this can, I was just thinking, it's never sitting there like wondering, like, what is my purpose? <laughs> <laughs> it's not like, what do I do with my life? What am I here for? It's not like it, having an existential crisis like your water. It just knows what it is. Like it, it knows what to do. It doesn't have to ask, what is my purpose? And I'm jealous of that. I wish it was that simple for me. Okay, I see what you're saying. Because that question, what is my purpose, is like the end all be all question, it feels like. Like it feels like from the time that you're like five years old, everybody's asking you like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Which is kind of an intense question to ask a five year old, like if you think about it. But then the question doesn't really go away. Because then when you graduate high school, it's like, where are you going to go to college? Or what are you going to do? And then when you graduate college, everyone's like, what are you going to do with all that money that you spent Mm -hmm. to get that degree? Or then it's like, oh, okay, well, how am I supposed to find who I want to get married to or navigate relationships? Or oh, do I want to move to a new city? Do I want to get a job in the field that I got my degree in or make a complete 180 or do I like when I become a new parent like it just doesn't go away so we thought that there is no one more plagued by this question what is my purpose than college students because they have to field it like 500,000 times especially at family gatherings and so Audrey one of our storytellers and Luke our producer went and asked some college students about that So can you just introduce yourself really quickly and tell me like who you are, what's your name, that kind of thing. My name is Ryan. My name is Abe. Madeline Inman. Mary Claire. My name is Emily Meyer. Me llamo Shane Zamalt. Y estás estudiando educación de español. That's awesome. Thank you. (laughs) Talk to me about the next few years of your life and what do you think they're going to look like? That is a great question, and definitely a question I still ask myself every day. I'm kind of coming up on a big decision. I've got a fork in the road in front of me that I'm trying to make a decision about. I can speak to this next year. Uh, I know I have somewhat of a plan for that. I would really like to travel and explore. I'd like to be able to go all over. I'm really excited for these next few years to kind of be on my own and see like what I can do without my family right by me and I'm excited but also pretty nervous. What do you think about that question? Do you like when people ask you like what's next? Um, I definitely feel a lot of pressure, you know, at least act like I've got it together, have options, that sort of thing. So there's kind of this pressure and a bit of a standard to live up to. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie to you, those are my least favorite questions ever. I don't really know if it's because I'm in like my last stages of college and most people have kind of a next step planned out, but I'm kind of someone who flies by the seat of their pants. So like being asked about my future makes me really nervous. You know, the future can be scary sometimes and and I I still get nervous about the future just because, you know, I know that God has a plan for everything and, you know, stuff like that. But sometimes it is hard to, for at least for me to, you know, to stick with that and buy into that and kind of let go of control. 
I definitely do feel like they're expecting something really short and snappy and like bright that sounds good. Like I would love to say to them, I know I'm gonna be, you know, a doctor or an investment banker or like X, Y, Z. And like, I do feel like there's this expectation to have something like certain. Um, but I also think that that's not necessarily how people or God work all the time. You know, at the end of the day, if I don't become a lawyer or if I don't go to law school or if I don't like, you know, save the whole world. <laughs> okay. Do you think that this kind of question of like, what is my purpose is a question that can be answered like once and for all? Do you get to like answer it one time and be done? It's it's hard with the purpose question because it's constantly evolving and you constantly find new interests or your like in the college career almost everybody have changed their major at least once mm -hmm. anything can really happen but i think it really depends on who you are as a person i mm -hmm. think that it would continue long through our lives i don't think there's a certain age we reach where we you know we know it at all i do feel like we as people that we all have slightly different like flavors you know what I mean I know that whatever I'm gonna be doing like there's certain skills I feel like God has specifically given me that I'm gonna be using no matter what I'm doing like my mission is to wake up and go to class <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> get coffee study for a few hours like that's been my mission and when I'm 45 you know I think that's gonna look pretty different and somebody might ask me at 45 and I'll say yeah I mean today I'm taking my kid to soccer practice so I think it is ever evolving. I know with me and a lot of other college athletes, like your identity gets wrapped up in that. You know, you're here to play baseball and do that. And like, that's all you know for a while. And that's that's kind of where I was at for a while. But, uh, you know, and then with everything going on now, the season ending so abruptly, it, it really makes you think like, well, that's over with. So, you know, that's, it's not my purpose. I'm, I'm here to do other things. So the college students are dealing with a lot of uncertainty and a lot of question marks, just like many of us can relate to, if honestly. And we also had this question of what happens when what you think your purpose is doesn't really turn out the way that you expected it to. So Audrey, talked to Megan about that. I met my friend Megan years ago while we were both pursuing our dream jobs. I'm studying film and she's studying elementary education. We graduate from the same university and we're privileged to both get the jobs we dreamed of. For Megan, that's teaching first grade. She shows up to school for the first day of class and she's been given a class of third graders. It's a little bit of a shock, but she adjusts and really leans into caring for and loving her students. But something changes. The longer she stays, the more she realizes she's being pulled away from teaching. So she makes the heartbreaking decision to leave what she loves. Then that summer, she gets married and decides to take a job as a teller at a bank. She sees it as a pay the bills kind of job until she can find something that feels more connected to her passion. So she adjusts again. But then four years later, Megan is still at the bank, wondering if she will ever find a job as fulfilling and meaningful as she thought being a teacher would be. I just felt like I was gonna be stuck there forever and that's not what I saw for my life. When I was a teacher, I felt so much pride because like, you know, everybody loves teachers. <laughs> but then when I was a teller and people would ask me, so what do you do? I'm saying like, oh, I'm a teller at a bank. Nobody's interested in that. <laughs> I was like so embarrassed for a long time, especially my first like two years at the bank to tell people what I was doing because they're like, oh, why would you leave teaching to be a teller? So I struggled with that a lot. I was like, am I going to be defined by this job the rest of my life? And I had so many conversations with my husband about that because I felt like this job was defining me. You know, you wake up in the morning, whatever job you have, and you put on your attire for the day. You put on your uniform for the day, whatever that is. And even the way I was like dressing for my job, it had to, it had to be a, a specific dress code, but it was like not me at all. When you are going through a change in your life and you feel like everybody's kind of figured their life out or God's moving in their life, um, but not yours, it's easy to feel like God's forgotten you, but that's, it's not true. 
the more I processed it and the more I went to God about it, the more I saw, again, just that underlying, okay, this is what God says your purpose is. It doesn't matter what you wear. It doesn't matter where you work. Your purpose is to follow Him and to love people. Megan told me that after she had this realization, that's when things started to become okay again. She wasn't as upset about her situation. She wasn't as discouraged. She started to find hope in the everyday moments. So when I was so focused on myself and I was focused on what other people thought, that's when I was having a difficult time going to work. I was having a difficult time loving people at my job. But when I saw the underlying truth, God's truth, that's when it was so much easier to get up in the morning. It was so much easier to go to my job and, and be the very best I could be. It was so much easier to love people and let God's love shine through me. What strikes me about Megan's experience is that a lot of us get caught up in the same thing. It's easy when things aren't going the way we plan to see ourselves as being stuck, waiting for our purpose. But where we really get stuck is in believing that we can't live out our purpose wherever we are, doing whatever we're doing. I think through my past experiences, I've learned that there's ebbs and flows of life and there's going to be more uncertain times in the future, but the purpose never changes. And I think that's where, where we can find rest and peace in that, is that it doesn't matter how life changes. We have constant hope that never changes in Jesus. Hi, I'm Andy Burton. Hey Andy, I have a question for you. What do you want to be when you grow up? Ooh, I definitely want to be an actress. Because I went to Hollywood this once, and I saw, like, on the sidewalk, there were stars with p famous people's names. I want my own star. I want to live in Hollywood, especially with my family. And if you could do anything right now, what would it be? Other than talking to you guys? Yeah. I don't know. I have a lot of fun things that I really love to do. I love animals, so I'd probably want to go to the zoo and the science museum. I love, I love science. Okay, tell me how old you are one more time. I am seven, almost eight. So you, you're seven, almost eight. Uh -huh. What do you think is the meaning of life? I think the meaning of life is it's just an opportunity to have a great time and know God. That's why he created the earth. I think I heard you say that the meaning of life is so that we would know God. Is yeah, that what you're saying? basically, yeah. That's a super smart answer. <laughs> That's a really <laughs> smart answer. What can you do if you don't know what you're supposed to do? I can ask God or maybe like ask somebody. Um, scientists, they ask a lot of things and I kind of want to be a scientist so I can get close to lava, but I don't want to die. You'll be a, a scientist actress, right? Yes, I'll be an actress who has to act as out a scientist. That would be the best. And I also really love riding horses, so that would be amazing. So we've talked to college students who are at the beginning of all of this in the first quarter of their life. And we talked to Megan, who's a little bit further along and living out her purpose. And we talked to a can of sparkling water. <laughs> uh, but seriously, we thought, let's talk with somebody who's in their fourth quarter, who's already lived a lot of this out. We have a very special guest to talk with today. His name is Dick Foth, and he's actually my Uncle Dick. So that's probably what we'll call him the rest of the show. He's married to Ruth. And this last St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, he started his 79th trip around the sun, which means he's 78 years old. And he's been married to Ruth for 57 years this July. They've got four children together, 12 grandchildren, ages 28 to four, and one great grandkid with another on the way. He's been a college president, a pastor, a life coach to 
leaders in Washington, D.C., but I think what he would tell you is that he's a collector of people, and then he likes to connect those people, and he's a great storyteller. And he just told us that his biggest dream is to be invited one day to talk to college students when he's 90. So, Uncle Dick, it's great to have you here. Thanks a million, Jason. Wonderful to be here with you. So we'll just get right to it. I know that you've actually spent time with presidents and kings and grandkids. And I think someone like that would probably have a lot to talk to us about uh, finding purpose. So how do you think about finding purpose? This idea of purpose is captured for me, I think, when I read the story in Scripture of Moses in front of the burning bush. It's Exodus 3. There's something about that that hits on a variety of, of points relative to purpose. For example, it says, who, who am I that I should do such and such? And then talking to the voice from the burning bush, he says, so who are you? What God shall I say has sent me to the Egyptians? That whole business. This question of who am I is at the heart of purpose. So you're telling me I'm asking the wrong question. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm saying with, within the larger purpose question, the, 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 the focus tends to shift to what do I do? What am I going to, what jobs am I going to have? Or yeah. what skills do I have? How many degrees do I need? To, and the, the who am I question really comes out of um, where was I brought up? Who brought me up? What are the values that are instilled? All of that sort of thing. And uh, I think probably we don't spend enough time there in talking about purpose. So where do we start? I think... I start discovering who I am when I really start looking at who God is. Uh, there was a there was a preacher back in the last century by the name of A. W. Tozer, who said this. He said, "Whatever comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you." And I think that's what brings me hope because that gives me this sense of. Who am I designed to be and what I'm designed for both in the long and the short term uh, start showing up as I walk through life. And I, I had a moment when I first went to Washington, D.C. I'd been president of a small college for 14 years, took a year's sabbatical. I was 50, took a year's sabbatical to try to figure out what to do with the last half. And in the course of that, I was invited to Washington, D.C. to work behind the scenes one on one with people in places of leadership. So it was private. You don't send out newsletters and pictures about these people. You just walk behind the scenes. And I was on my way to have my first meeting with a senator. And I'm a kid from East Oakland, California. I wasn't raised with money. I didn't go to Yale. I didn't really learn how to play golf. Well, I still don't know how to play golf, but I, I didn't <laughs> really know how to, until I was 51 years old, right? So I didn't. I'm not a country club person historically. But I'm going to meet my first senator. I'm sort of whining to God as I'm walking through, I think it was the Russell office building adjacent to the Capitol on Capitol Hill. And I'm saying, God, what do I say to this person? I, you know, I, I know I've had this, these several decades of experience in these other arenas, but Capitol Hill in D.C. is a totally different ballgame. They speak different languages. And so I'm whining, right? And I felt like the Lord said this. And it wasn't a voice, but it was a nudge. And he said, Foth, here's the deal. He calls me Foth. He said, Foth, here's the deal. <laughs> um, if you speak to the king of the universe in the morning, it's not so hard to speak to a United States senator in the afternoon. Oh, man. Oh, dang. So in a, in a time where, where young people in particular feel paralyzed by options, driven by FOMO, fear of missing out. So I'm, I'm inundated with information. How do you make decisions? How do you think about yourself? And, and when you look at scriptures, here's, here's the God who's out to get you, but not in a bad way. He's, mm -hmm. he's the God when you totally foul up 
and you go back to what you think you know after you've so disappointed him, i.e. Simon Peter after the resurrection, he's the God who hunts you down when you're going back to commercial fishing. He doesn't vaporize your boat. I'd vaporize your boat if you messed up. (laughs) But But he fixes your breakfast on the beach. What do you do when the God who is the king of the universe and you failed him, hunts you down to fix your breakfast. What do you do with a God like that? My friend Gordon Fee, who's a textual scholar, New Testament textual scholar, wonderful man, said what you do with a God like that is you follow him. I hear you saying, if I talk to the king of the universe in the morning, then in the afternoon, I could probably discover what to do with my day Yep. And if I can discover what to do with my day and I can look to the God who says I am, then I can figure out more each day about who I am. And that's maybe how we get pointed at purpose. Is that kind of what I yep. hear you saying? No, I think, I think you distilled it very well. Is that I don't know if I have tomorrow, whether I'm 21 or 71, I do not know what tomorrow's going to bring. There's some power in that in terms of saying, how do I utilize these hundreds of minutes per day to uh, be beneficial, do things that um, are investments rather than spendings. Tell me what you mean about that. Uh, Expand on that idea. Uh, Do things that are investments rather than expenses. Over over the years, I've I've discovered that we deal with two things our whole lives, uh, relationships and money. And one of those will make you rich. And Mm. it ain't money. Mm. Um, You know, money, as we're seeing, can go away overnight. In one week, the stock market lost 30% of its value. Boom. Right. Okay. And the reason those two things play such a big part in my life is because they are my life. My life consists of relationships from the time that I'm born, from that point until I die, relationships are the heart of who I am. And money is how I give my life away, if you will. So when I, when I give my life away in work, I can hoard it, I can share it, I can spend it, or I can invest it. And my point is this, is, is that relationships are investments. No guy lying on his deathbed say, could you please bring me my credit card bills one more time so I can hold them close to my chest <laughs> as I can find them. Nobody does that. But nobody in their right mind wants to die alone. Right. They want the people they love at their bedside. And so the question is, how do I invest myself? Because money will come and go. But the relationships that you have, the quality relationships that you have, are the things that sustain you through life. So I've heard you tell me first, I was asking the wrong question. (laughs) And then you gave me some good questions. You said, I should be asking, who am I? Uh, I should be asking, who is God? I should be asking, uh, who are the people that I am around? Who do I know? Right. And I should be asking, what do I do with my time? What do I do with my money? So what are you going to tell Foth in his 20s, 30s about what to do with those questions? I think I would encourage Foth to take seriously the fact that there might be a God. And um, I, just, I just think that, the, that that journey of discovering God is a daily journey then of discovering who I am. Because if I'm made in his image, the more I discover about him, the more I discover about me. And that gives me one thing that we desperately need in our culture and in our lives, and that is confidence. We need mm-hmm. self-confidence rightly framed. I love that. 
I think sometimes when you're 18 and having to decide if you want to go to college or if you're deciding whether you want to do a career change or just you have these big decisions and you think, well, if I make this choice, then everything will be different. But I love that there's been different points in your life where you've kind of reevaluated. So what would you tell someone that's thinking about a decision and how that relates to who they are and what they're going to do? What advice would you give them or what questions can they ask to figure out the next step in their purpose? You know, I've done what I would consider four or five major things in my life, career-wise, which are related but not the same by a long shot. Mm -hmm. But I think if you think this way, that this is the start of a road, not the be-all and end-all of what I'm going to be or do. Focus on the day. Understand that whatever it is you do in the role you're going into, at whatever level, look at the people around you, see over those first weeks and months who gets the job done, who relates well to others, who knows what they're talking about, who doesn't have to be the center of attention, who, who facilitates others, and hang out with that person because you're going to learn some stuff. And I think that's, that goes back to what you were talking about earlier about how it's relationships and money that kind of, you know, yep. affect our purpose. And so when you find those relationships, no matter where you are, knowing that purpose isn't about what you do, but about who you are, that you'll be okay wherever you go, because you can always find those relationships and you can always continue to learn more about who God is and therefore right. who you are. Let's imagine that you actually are standing at a college campus. You're looking at a college student in the eye who is really unsure right now about what they're going to do with the rest of their life, but also in the next few months because things are uncertain. And you have, you have a minute to encourage them. My experience in the last decade is that young people are paralyzed by the possibilities. And what I'm going to say is whatever you do with your life, do something. I believe there is a God that loves us, has us in his heart, and wants the very best for us because we express his image in the world and his dreams for the world. So I want to take advantage of this day. I want to make this day count. I want to get to know him intimately. And in so doing... I will touch the people around me. When you follow Jesus, he takes you places you never dreamed you could go. He gives you ideas you never thought you could have. And he gives you friends who last forever. Oswald Chambers, <clears throat> as a young man, came to faith out of the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He was an artist. He ended up being a chaplain in the First World War and died in Cairo at age 43 of a burst appendix in part because he gave his bed to a wounded soldier. And when in, in his biography, they said of him when he was asked the question, so how do you live your life? He said, I trust God and take the next step. So what I would say to you is whatever you do with your life next, do something, start, trust God, take the next step, whether it's with a relationship with knowing God more intimately or with a position, a career, do that thing. And when you're doing that thing, trust me in this, God is cheering you on. What does it make you feel when you hear that? Yeah, yeah that, was, that, was, that was something. That was really, really encouraging to hear. I think that's something that like everybody my age needs to hear. That's like, I have mentioned before how nervous I am for the future. And like, he just kind of put it all into perspective that like, as long as we trust the Lord and have enough faith to take the next step, like that's kind of all that matters. I think my general purpose, I made that decision the day I chose to follow Christ. It was today I died myself and I live for Christ. Whereas like my specific, what does God want me to do with the next? month, the next five years. I think that is an answer that kind of changes. My purpose is just to like 
live out today to the best of my ability because that's the only thing that I have answers for right now. I love just that boldness, like that attitude. Um, if you know God's in something, just to step into it and kind of let go of the fear. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something, you know, I need to hold on to right now. guys, it's Audra again, and I just wanted to come back and encourage you about something that I learned while I was recording this podcast. One of the college students that I got to record with was actually my cousin, Mary Claire, and we don't see each other all the time. We see each other every once in a while, and so normally the questions that we ask each other when we see each other are sort of like catch-up questions, like, what have you been doing since I saw you last? What are you going to be doing in the time until I see you again, like that kind of thing. And they're just kind of surface level questions. But when I was interviewing her for the podcast and I was asking her, what do you think your purpose in life is? I'm a little embarrassed to say that that's probably one of the deepest conversations that we've ever had. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about somebody that you love and that you care about. And I want you to go and have a meaningful conversation with them, like I had with Mary Claire and ask them questions like, what do you think your purpose is in life? What are you thinking about the future? What are you nervous about or excited about? And I think that you'll be really encouraged and excited by the conversation that you get to have. Thanks so much for listening to season one of the You've Heard It Said podcast. You can find questions, resources, and more on our conversation guide in the show notes wherever you're listening. We'll be taking a short break, but we'll be back soon for season two. And you can be the first to know when new episodes drop by subscribing to our email list in the show notes below. Until we come back, make sure to do the things that you've heard said. And if you've enjoyed this season, please rate and review. It really does help more people find these hope-filled conversations. See you soon.